Greetings ladies and mentalgens and welcome to today's Reddit series video from the subreddit HFY called Children of the Gun Chapter 11 written by Alt Cypher. Lee pulled up around a spinning hulk of a starship and flattened her roll once she cleared it. Scanners were showing intermediate escape spot signals, ephemeral and fleeting but always there. She throttled the main engines down to nearly nothing and maneuvered on thrusters only. The debris field was too cluttered for any dramatic moves. The ship shuddered as Lee tapered the port lateral thruster. She flattened the engines to keep them alive and eased in behind the escape pod that had only just come clear of the shard of the broken starship. The automated systems tried to help her, but they were soon overwhelmed by the chaos of the spiraling, expanding cloud of dead ship. Lee watched the camera as the cargo hauled as she floated her ship forward and enveloped the tiny escape pod. Proximity alarms sounded sporadically, and she would silence them with an off-handed slap. The docking lights rolled over to green as the pod cleared the doors. Lee hit the command seal and the cargo doors and moved off to find her next rescue pod. She kept an eye on the cargo hold as the escape pod was buried to a pressurized section, then popped open, and two wary, scared humans crawled out. Lee rolled the ship over and passed a rotating spa. She flipped on the intercom and said, Sorry, I can't be there to welcome you. Through those doors, the crew quarters, with a bathroom and food if you need it. I'm looking for more escape pods, and this debris field is too dense to trust an autopilot. Before her new passengers could answer, Lee flipped off the intercom, keeping her hyper-focused on navigation of the debris field when what was only thing keeping her from driving herself crazy over Cull. Entering a conversation with the shell-shocked strangers would do nothing to distract her from Cull or prevent her from flying into a dislodged wall, so she ignored them. Only half-conscious of her actions, Lee hit the switch to lock the flight deck so that she wouldn't be disturbed. An hour after starting her search for survivors and two more escape pods later, Lee tried contacting anyone who might be able to find out about Cal had but received nothing back but static. The flotsam surrounding her sparkled with wan starlight from the distant local sun. The scanners had been rendered useless as bits of ship continued to pulverize themselves against each other until they'd been reduced to sensor-jamming haze. The larger pieces of the ship hull continued their silent ballet between the stars. Lee reset her comms to listen for the radio beacons from the escape pods and strained her eyes to watch for the strobe atop each escape pod. Lee caught sight of a blinking light just behind what she thought was the ship's rear quadrant. She tapped the thruster controls and felt the ship nudge around the obstacle. As she got closer and got around the obstruction, something gnawed at the back of her mind. With all the stresses of today, she talked it up to fried nerves and edged her way towards the ship beacon. It then it dawned on her. While Lee could see the blinking light, the radio was silent. Even in this debris field, she should be able to hear the repetitive pinging of the radio beacon at this range. There was always the possibility that the escape pod's radio had been damaged in the attack. But those things were designed to ride through hell with little more than a scuffed paint. Besides... She thought there doesn't seem to be that much damage, just a few scorch marks and some chipped paint. The proximity alarm rang out again and Lee slapped the mute button without thinking. Then weapons lock alarms screeched through the cockpit and Lee jerked the controls hard to the left. Her hand had made the decision before her conscious mind had even processed the sound. Half of the control board was screaming for attention. With all the clutter surrounding her, Lee had no idea from where the threat originated. All she knew was that she needed to keep moving to be harder to hit. Lee spun and flipped the ship as much as skill as she could muster, but she was constrained by the wreckage around her. Trigg was startled away by the tent flap being thrown open. Cal slipped in and pulled the tent shut behind him. You up? Cal asked. I am now, Trigg said. He wiped his hand across his face and tried to remember what day it was. That thing you said yesterday, right after we got you back. About going back in time, Trigg asked. Yeah, Cal said. What about it? Is it true? Did you really go back in time? Trigg sat up and stayed in his sleeping bag. I don't know, he said, but it, uh, it was real. Do you understand that even if the most vivid dreams I've ever had, I could always tell something wasn't right, like, uh, like the universe was at arm's length. Does that make sense? I guess, Cal said. 
But this thing, Trick said, whatever the Lepax did to me, it was as real as everything I've ever known in my life. I could feel the rocks under my boots and smell the burnt air in my nose. I got hungry, I got tired, I peed, I even had to take a dump. You ever hear of a hallucination or a dream where you pooped? Cal smiled. Poop dreams aren't something I'm really familiar with. Yeah, okay, that's fair, Trick said. But my point is, it's not just a feeling of being real. It's all the little things. The stuff that gets edited out of dreams. My beard grew. I had to fall asleep at my left side because I can't fall asleep in any other position. Weird little things that dreams just skip over. Cal chewed on his lip for a moment. Trick looked at him with a cock on his head. You're planning something. Why do you think they sent you to Balcor? It was maybe the worst day of my life, watching Deacon and those kids get killed. That's the only thing I can think of. I've been in plenty other fights and on plenty other planets. The only thing I can think of was Balcor, which is just so awful. Trigg said. Yeah, Carl said. Mine too. Trigg raised an eyebrow in question. Worst day of my life, Carl said. The day Lee and the baby got shut up. I never knew why she didn't come for me when I called for extraction. Then they ambushed her while she was bringing in escape pods. I don't think I've ever felt alive since they told me. I'm walking. I'm just doing things, but I'm just going through the motions. Running out of clock until my time is to join them both. Trick kept quiet and let his friend talk. There were some dark days when I got back home, Carl said. I had a gun in my mouth more than once. Did I ever tell you that? Trigg shook his head no. I'm not exactly proud of it, Carl said. It hasn't happened in a while now. I think I'm past the worst of it. But you want to talk worst here by life, man. That's it. The day my wife and unborn child got vaped by an alien ambush. So now you wonder if you can go back and change history. Part of me wants to be true and more than anything in our history of ever. But the cynical part of me says it's a false hope and wants to hate you for that, Carl said. That's why you came here asking about it. You want to know if I really went back. Yeah, Cal said. All I can tell you is it felt real to me, Trick said. Are you thinking of trying to go back? Thinking about it, yes, Trick said. Cal looked at him in surprise. Trick continued, you're not going to ever sleep well again if you don't try. You always wonder what if and it'll tear you up inside. If you try to stop you, you'll end up blaming me for their deaths. So I'll help you. It's the safest option. If we do save her, maybe we can shave the ship too, Carl said. We wouldn't have had to take that crappy rental out here to help Eddie and sleep in these nasty tents. That would be nice, Trick said. You remember that stuff the enemy and Balko used? Yeah, some big chemical name. It was a mission I was on when I had to call for extraction, destroying their stockpile. If you can go back in time and you can change the past, maybe you could bring some of that stuff here. Grab a couple barrels and keep it handy for when this mission pops up. You know, that stuff's got off all right. It sets gravel on fire, Carl said. That's why Balko burned. Well, yeah, I was there too, remember? A little bit of that in the Lepax and Catman might make them reconsider invading the space, Trick said. Gravel, Carl said. On fire, burning rocks, exploding on contact with water. Turns into hydrochloric and hydrofluoric acid. That crap is super nasty. That's why I only want two barrels, Trigg said. Carl stared at him for a moment and said, Ah, I'll see what I can do. End of chapter. Children of the Gun, chapter 12. Written by Alt Cipher. Carl felt a crunch of the dead grass beneath his chest as he leaned forward, back on Balcor. He thought, for his long rifle was propped up in front of him, though not stabilized. He glanced over the top of the scope and saw the facility that he knew to be his target. Look, Diego said from beside Cal, all I'm saying is that gold doesn't let them play games like a fiat currency does. D, Cal whispered, I didn't come halfway across the universe to argue about our newest conspiracy theory. Well, you asked, Diego said. I suppose I did, Cal said. He looked through the scope atop the rifle and scanned the perimeter of the facility. Seven visible guards, just like the first time he was here. That vehicle parked out front looks like it will cause us trouble, but it'll be set with the whole time, Carl thought. He turned back to Diego and said, I need you to trust me, D. A ghost of confusion passed across Diego's face on hearing that, uh, 
Sure, Carl? I know you won't believe this, but our mission is about to go tango uniform. Carl said, get Lee on the comms and have her set down off-grid to Charlie Green right away, no matter what Ops says. Next, have Breshine and his crew dust the whole east side of the complex. Cal, our orders are quick and clean. Ordering an airstrike is neither of those things. Besides, you heard the briefing, the nasty crap that they've got in there. Your order, an airstrike, and all that crap gets out and starts killing. Well, everyone, this is why I want you to trust me. Intel is bad. What else is new? Intel is bad and the east side of the complex isn't a storage like they said. The east side is a garrison. They've got over a hundred soldiers in there. We start our mission, then they place gets too hot and we end up running for our lives. Mission failure. Vaping this whole place is the right answer. How do you know all of this? Diego asked. You wouldn't believe me if I told you, Cal said. Call Lee and Bershine. I'm going to see about the alternate route in. When Bershine lights up the east side, we should be able to slip into the west side. Diego searched Carl's face for a moment before nodding. He tapped the radio button on his vest and spoke quickly and quietly into the receiver. Carl looked over the facility through his scope and had found their new route within moments. Okay, Diego said. Lee and Bersheim are on their way. I hope you know what you're doing. Me too, Carl said. He slipped his rifle onto his back and started crawling to his left, keeping his body below the ridge line. Diego grabbed his gear and followed along. The two men made good time considering they moved on their knees and elbows. Ten minutes later, Gal and Diego were crouched behind a small boulder just above the enemy facility. Bershime ETA, 90 seconds, Diego whispered. Gal nodded, not wanting to risk verbal communication. He counted the seconds in his head until he heard the massive screeching boom tear through the sky overhead. A dozen spots began glowing blue in the low clouds overhead. The blue spots grew brighter and brighter until they resolved into ships as they burst through the cloud barrier. An alarm rang out through the facility, and Cal could hear the worried shouts of the soldiers inside. Cal and Diego watched as the human fighters dropped out of the sky and began laying waste to the other side of the facility. Orange balls of flame leapt up into the sky as bombs crashed to the surface. They felt the ground beneath them vibrate time and time again as the friendly ordnance bit into the hostile encampment. They smelled spent explosives and burned flesh and carbonized buildings as the weapons did their work. Between the light and the sound, the enemy facility was in chaos. A few stray shots from handheld weapons arced up high towards the human fighters with no damage. Cal waved to Diego forward and they ran towards the facility while the troops inside were distracted with the aerial bombardment. As they rounded the outlying buildings, they ran into one of the guards rushing to his post. The alien and the humans were both so shocked that neither reacted for half a heartbeat. Then Diego whipped out a blade and kept strapped to his thigh and ran it through the alien's throat. The tip of the blade just poked out the far side. The unfortunate alien gave a small gargle as the blood welled up and choked him, then slid to the ground with no further objections. Diego pulled his knife from the fallen enemy, wiped it on his body's uniform, and then nodded to Cull. The humans made their way through the facility, avoiding guards when possible and engaging them when only necessary. They could still hear the sporadic booms from the attack outside and caught shouted orders from terrified aliens now and then. After what seemed like a lifetime of running and hiding, Cal and Diego ran into the storage room. The room was vast, dark and unattended and stuffed full of barrels. Okay, Cal said. There's a cargo hauler over there to the left. We're going to load up what we can of this and then blow the rest of it up. Diego turned to Carl. What? We're stealing this crap? Some of it, yeah, Carl said. He headed off to find the hauler he knew would be there. Carl, Carl! Diego called after him with no effect. Diego half jogged to catch up to him. Carl, our mission is to get rid of it. This isn't a shopping spree. Cal paused and spun back to face Diego, he said. Get it loaded as fast as you can. I'll start laying the charges. They found the hauler, and Diego started walking the barrels up the ramp. Cal moved his way through the storage room, placing explosive charges every so often throughout. 
He came back to Diego once he got more charges, but otherwise worked silently and alone. When Cal had no more charges left, he met up with Diego and the hauler. How many did you get? Cal asked. About a dozen, Diego said. Now can you tell me what's going on? Not yet. Sorry, Cal said. Let's get the hell out of here first. You drive. I'll ride shotgun. Time is set for... Cal glanced down at his watch. Eight minutes, thirty-five seconds. Mark. Diego and Cal climbed up into the cab of the hauler and drove up the ramp out of the storage room. The bombardment had stopped and the two men emerged from the blasted housecape of fire, rubble, and bodies. Diego drove the hauler as fast as he could to put as much distance between them and the rigged storeroom as possible. On the drive out of the facility, the only saw one surviving alien soldier, but Diego ran him over with his much more massive hauler. A little over eight minutes after they left the storeroom, just as they rounded a small hill outside the facility, a deep bass rumble shook the vehicle and Carl turned around just in time to see a fireball erupt from behind them. That's that then, Carl said. Get us over to Lee and let's get the hell out of here. When they reached Lee's ship, Carl jumped out of the hauler and ran up to the boarding ramp. Lee! Carl shouted as he tore through the ship. Carl! Lee's voice rang out of the bulkheads as she raced back to meet him. Cal and Lee fell into each other's arms just after the galley. Oh, I've missed you, Cal said. You don't know how much. I wasn't sure I should come, but uh, you called for me. I never could refuse you, Lee said, even if it meant... Uh, she trailed off and stared at her belly. Lee, I'm glad you came. If you hadn't, well, I don't think I would have ended well. Lee cocked her head to Cal. What do you mean? Listen, I know you'll think I'm crazy, but I've been sent back in time. By the Lepax, she asked. Cal stopped short. Yes, yes, how did you know? I came back too, Lee said. Don't you remember? You tried to talk me out of it. No, Lee, no. You, um, you died here, on Balcor. Well, above it, really. I came back to save you, Cal said. Oh, Lee said... I remember it differently. We both lived, but I flew down here to rescue you after your mission went bad. I was so stressed about it, I lost the baby. I had the Lebec send me back, and I was planning on not coming to the surface. I remember calling for you after the mission went bad, and you sent someone else while you went to rescue escape pods. One, how the ships ambushed you and blew you up. I came back to save you. Guys, Diego's voice echoed up from the cargo hold. Little help. Oh... Right, Cal said. Look, I've got to help D real quick. Get ready to take off. We can talk about this, uh... We have time now. All the time in the world. Cal felt his smile all the way into his soul. End of chapter. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with. But the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well. I will see you all in the next episode. And I hope that you all have a fantastic time until then. Cheers.